Anyway, Psalm 136, verse 2. It says, Give thanks to the Lord, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Amen. Amen. All right, let's, if you're willing and able, let's stand and worship together this morning.
favorite song. You may not know it. I think it's done in the church. Uh, I know it before COVID. It's been a long time. The choir ran into the congregation. It's called The Stand. And there's a line in here. It happens a couple times. And it says, My soul now to stand. You either praise that song or praise the Lord. Because you know that when you do, you can actually see the Lord in your life. And you can see the Lord in your life. And you can see the Lord in your life. And you can see the Lord in your life. And you can see the Lord in your life. And you can see the Lord in your life.
worship you and have for us. I'm so thankful for those of us that are here worshiping together as Christians. Uh, I love this church. I love these people. I ask you to just shower them with many blessings. Be with those that can't be here. Lord, be the bride. He's about to bring us your word. Let your word flow through him and touch our hearts this morning, Lord. All these things we pray. Amen. But it's when Jesus, you know, was, he was walking and talking and teaching and showing and demonstrating what life is like in the kingdom. And he kept setting those examples and really trying to mold and shape the disciples into those leaders that they would need to be to lead the early church. Now, there's one occasion where James and John, remember those two brothers, sons of Zebedee, I love their nickname, the Sons of Thunder. Just kind of kind of gives you an idea of what their personalities was like. But they kind of they kind of put it up to mom's ears. Mom, we want you to go and ask Jesus a question. And so uh, Solomon goes and asks Jesus a question. Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, you sit on your throne, would you grant that my sons, James and John, will sit at your right and your left hand? Remember what Jesus said? Uh, it's not not my place to put you there. That's my father's throne. Um, besides the point, are you able to drink the cup that I have to bear? And you know, they, had, they were clues. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. Now, let's pick up the story in verse 41. When the ten, that's the other disciples, when they began, uh, when they heard, they began to be indignant at James and John. And have any of you ever been indignant at someone else, that's okay to nod your head and shake you know, raise your hand, because we all have, right? We've all been there. They were really angry at James and John. They knew where this was coming from. And it says, Jesus called them to him and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles, that just means, you know, out in the world, all the rulers, they lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But, he says, this is the way you see it, this is the way you've always known it, but, verse 43, it shall not be so among you. What is Jesus saying there? Our lives as followers of Christ, has, they have to be different than all the rest of the world. He says, it shall not be so among you, whoever will be great among you must be your servant. And whoever will be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, now think about that for a moment. Jesus has just taken everything that everyone has ever known, the whole wide world philosophy and world system, and completely turned it upside down. He inverted the system. He said... If you want to be great, you don't step on everybody else and climb to the top and be successful. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you have to be everybody else's servant. Now, that, that, that just does not make sense when you talk about that out of the world. But Jesus says, this is the way it's, it is. And he says, this is the way you as followers have to live your life. All right, so let's think about that for a moment. Think about the, the world rulers, the world's authorities that we know about. There are some good ones, what we call good rulers, right? But by and large, a lot of them are evil. I mean, they're bad. Even the news, they don't report all the things that go on. And they really are abusing their authority, right? Abusing. We see this kind of abuse on display all the time, everywhere we look. In some families, men try to become tyrants. 
And they dominate women and they dominate children with abuse of power. Authority gets abused in workplaces. It gets abused in the schoolyards. Bullies lord their strength, lord their influence over anyone that they can. Even our inventions and innovations and technologies end up being used for evil in our world. Classic example of that, of course, is Nazi Germany, where they took all the latest inventions and all the latest technologies and all the latest machinery and used it to put millions to death. Our authority, our rule over creation, uh, over creation, which, by the way, God gave to us in the beginning, right? He said, you're to rule over the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and all the creeping things that creeps on the earth. All of creation. He put it under our rule. But it's not just to be abusive towards it. It's to be responsible under God as part of the image that he put into us. Human ingenuity. Think of all the things that we've come up with, all the things that we've thought of as human beings, as a race, and all of our innovations. And just think what terrible things have been done in world history. Now, all these things are signs, they're signs that authority has been abused, that authority has been, has gone wrong somewhere down the road. And our ability to rule wisely over creation has largely been affected, been hampered by sin and pride. And in response to abuse of authority, some go to the opposite end of the spectrum, and they try to do away with all authority whatsoever, right? This is why you have people that just close themselves up, and, you know, they choose to abandon authority. You have this in the homes, fathers and husbands, they just become absent and totally disengaged from what's going on and passive, and families suffer without godly leadership. Abandoned by fathers is a profound problem in our society, and it affects everybody. Even when the father is gone, still he is influencing the rest of the family by his absence. What about a CEO, a person in charge of a business? What about that person who won't lead, won't make the difficult decisions when they need to be made? What's going to happen to that company? It's going to fail. What about a military commander who uh, is indecisive in a moment of great need? What happens? Maybe a demotion, maybe a court martial, just a delicate duty. What about a quarterback who walks into a huddle and looks at the other guys in the face and says, Well, guys, what do you think we should do? Probably not going to go so well for that team. The world needs leaders. The world needs good leaders, godly leaders. And when leadership is absent, or if leadership is avoided altogether, the consequences of that can be disastrous. Now, the corrupt rule of humans, that's kind of what we started with, right? It is restored only by the grace of God. Because think about this for a moment. Had it not been for God's interference and God's prevention of certain things, we as human beings would not be here today. We would have destroyed ourselves a long, long time ago. But God keeps thwarting evil. He does he allow evil to exist? Yes, he does. For a time. He allows it, but he keeps it in check. If he allowed just, just to, for human beings to completely have our way, we wouldn't be here today. We'd be destroyed. Think about the Tower of Babel. Here's an example in Genesis where early on in human history, people came together and they decided that they were great. That's basically what they said. Hey, we're good people. We're great people. And uh, we want the whole world to know it. So we're going to build a monument just like great people always do, right? We're going to build a monument. And we're going to let everybody in the world know that we're great. So they began to build what we call the Tower of Babel, right? Now, in and of itself, we look at that and say, what? What's the big deal? But God saw something that we didn't see. He looked ahead to the future and said, this is going down a path, a road. They're going to destroy themselves. And so what did God do 
Even in his judgment, he showed grace. But what did he do? He, he confused the languages because they could not communicate functionally anymore. They, they scattered. They spread out. The Tower of Babel failed. It was a failed experiment. God judged them in what they were doing because they were prideful, right? But even in their pride, God spared them. It was graceful. And sent them throughout the world. God saw how that project was going to end. It wasn't going to end well. And so he intervened. I wonder this morning just how many times God intervenes and we don't realize it. How many times when we look at something and say, this is terrible, and if we could just see from God's perspective, he would say to us, yeah, but it could be so much worse. You just don't realize how much God is acting and, and moving in this world around us. And we as Christians, we need to make sure that we're constantly praying for our leaders and praying for those in authority over us. Um, it, it, it's imperative that we do so. The Bible certainly commands that we do it, but it's for our own good. It's for our own sake that we do it under God. Even now, God keeps evil in check. But don't forget that. God intervenes and he frustrates the plans of evil people who want to do evil things. And yes, we do live in a bad world. But like I said, it could be so much worse. There was a time in this world when God looked over to all the creation, all the human beings living in the world. He said, every thought, every intention of their hearts and minds is evil. Now, thankfully, he sent his son Jesus to us. His spirit lives with us. And even though there's a lot of evil, there's a lot of bad going on, there's good here because God's spirit is still with us. And in a world dominated by this kind of authority, and this kind of destruction, and this kind of abuse of authority, what is the way forward? What is the hope that we have? What is the better way? Well, the answer to those questions, of course, is Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the one who takes the world, turns it upside down, and makes all things new. He started that process with you and me, right? He came first and foremost to restore our hearts back to God. Before Christ, before he did that, we couldn't do it. We were lost without him. But he came and he's turning us back to the Father. And there's coming a time, because Romans, if you read the book of Romans, Romans says all of creation is groaning, is longing for that day when Christ renews everything. There's coming a day when Christ is going to change this world like we've never seen it before. And he's going to res totally restore creation. Now, in my little pea brain, I cannot fathom what exactly that looks like. Because all we've known is corruption. All we've known is sin and evil in this world. There's coming a day when there's, that's not going to be anymore. It's going to be glorious, really. And in a world dominated by sin, sinful scrambling for power, Jesus told us that it's better to serve than to be served. Now these disciples that he was interacting with that day, they were arguing. They were, I'm sure they were trying to do it in a way that Jesus wouldn't hear Jesus knew what was going on. He called him out on it. He called him out on them on it because he knew this was the way of the world. This is the way we all are if we're left to our own devices, we're left to our own pride and sin. Jesus turned that around. He said it's better to serve than to be served. And then he gave the ultimate example. He pointed to himself. The Son of Man came to serve, to not be served. And he says he even was going to give his life as a ransom for many. That's the ultimate service. That's the ultimate sacrifice. That, what does that mean for us as Christians, as his followers? It means that our lives need to be lived sacrificially in service to others. It means we put other people ahead of our own wants and desires. It means that we serve sacrificially. It may cost us, yeah, it may cost us some money. It might cost us some time. It might cost us some emotional uh, strength. It's going to cost us. It may even cost our health. 
and serving someone else, you're helping me fail in the process. Jesus gave his very life. There, there's not a price too high when we're considering Jesus. And we, if you go back to the beginning, were made to be rulers with authority over creation. We know sin got in the way of that. Sin caused all kinds of problems. Jesus comes in and restores that. He doesn't, he's not saying that we serve all to get rid of authority. He's saying we serve in this way. He's restoring what authority really means. It's servant leadership. You serve. That's what Jesus says. Husbands are given authority in the family, but this authority is best expressed through loving, sacrificial leadership. Our leaders in government, we call them public servants, right? How many of them, though, look at themselves as a public servant? Or is it just something to, to gain status and gain riches and to gain power? Thank God for those of our leaders, whether in the local government, county, uh, city, state, nation, that still see themselves as servants of the public. Thank God for them. Pray for them. Pray for the others, though. They have to see that and, and understand what their role is. And everybody, no matter what our role, what our status, what our leadership or, or non-leadership, we need to put the good of other people ahead of the good of ourselves. And when we do that, God is honored. God is glorified. It may look different to us. It may make us uncomfortable for a while. But I'm telling you, this is what Jesus has commanded us to do. Jesus demonstrated this kind of selfless authority while he was on earth. The things that he said, the things that he did, this, is, this, is, this was him. Even in his birth. Think about his birth. It's unlike any other birth that we've heard of, right? Complete humility. Born in a stable for animals. Placed in a, a feeding trough where animals eat hay and whatever else they ate, grains. But this is how Jesus came into this world. Humbly. And he served his whole life. And he further humbled himself. In spite of all of his power. In spite of unlimited glory. He set all that aside. And he came to earth and he died on our behalf. Ultimate sacrifice. And Jesus did that for a number of reasons, yes. But in doing so, he completely inverted the world system. And that's not just a, a fact that we say, yeah, that's a great thing and we just move on with our business. That is practical knowledge for us. Jesus told us that because he intended us to live it out. He wasn't he wasn't just playing around with us. He meant business on the cross. He means business with us. And so we're to own it. We're to live it out. We're to, to put it to the test. Think about this. The next time that you are indignant with someone, the next time you're in conflict with someone else, it may be a friend, it may be a spouse, it may be someone else, but, but when you find yourself in that situation again, think about the other person. First, admit that you're wrong if you are wrong, right? Now, that's hard to do. Now, I know I'm right. I'm not giving up. Or it, you may just decide that the argument is not worth having in the first place. It's not worth winning. Be the first to back down. That flies in the face of everything that's in us prideful, right? Be the first to back down. Choose to prefer the other person's desires of your own desire. And then, see what happens. Now the other person may be completely shocked. You might be shocked yourself that you did that. But I, I want to give you a warning. When we live this way, our arrogant pride is still going to try to press the advantage. Still going to try to press um, through. And only God's Spirit can lead us back to humility, can lead us out of our pride, and, and lead us to a point where we are more concerned with the good of others than we are with ourselves. And that we're more concerned with the glory of God than our own glory. And that's exactly what we'll do in the process. We'll honor and glorify God. 
Now I want to close this way because it's very short, it's very simple, and it's very uh, brief. But it's something we have to pay attention to. Jesus told us the first commandment is to love God. The second commandment is to love other people. So love God, love other people. He said there's no other commandments that even touch this. Every other commandment is, is really a restatement of those two commandments. Now that we, we love God, we love people, and our job is to go out and do something about it. Because we love God, because we love people, let's demonstrate it. And in demonstrating that, we're going to point to other people to Christ. Because they're going to see Christ's spirit living in us. It's a, it's a high responsibility. It is a test of our faith that we will get no encouragement from the world in. But this is what Jesus says to us. Let's pray. Our Father God, we thank you so much for your word and your truth. Lord, not leaving us to our own devices, not leaving us in our sin and the pride that you sent your son and, and completely changed our lives. Father, you're continuing to do that on a day-to-day -day basis. We ask that you would just continue to mold and shape us to the people that you want us to be for your glory, for your kingdom. Father, help us to set aside any pride in us and put others first. To serve as Jesus served. To serve as you long for us to because you say that, that is true greatness when we empty ourselves. Father, we pray for every person here. All the, the things that would weigh us down. All the things that are holding us back. All the things that are causing stresses. Lord, we give those to you. We ask that you would work in your own will and in your own timing. Father, that you would have the glory, and we would give you the praise and honor for it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I pray that you have a great week this week. Um, we're going to sing one more song before this is. And uh, I will not be here next Sunday. We're taking the weekend. Uh, Ellen is turning two on Friday. So we are going to go off and do something with her this weekend. So but I look forward to seeing the following week when we get back. So let's sing this last song as we're just missing. Let's sing.